Hello everyone. So today we're going to discuss uh, a really some really important concepts in number theory which is reducing mod m modular residues complete residue system residue classes you know all of these things and these are some of the things that are used a lot in solving problems uh, right from like ioqm to even in more tst in certain cases the imo problems it's really good to know good to have the knowledge of some of these concepts so this is a problem from the harvard mit math tournament the hmmt this is held like twice a year i believe once in november december and the other time in february and so it's held twice a year one of the times it's in harvard the other time it's in mit and keep in mind that it's a tournament for high school so you guys can actually participate in it and um it's the problems are set by harvard and mit people but uh, the competition is specifically for high schoolers so it's it's a really nice tournament it has pretty good practice problems and in this video we're going to be looking at reducing mod n we're going to look at what modular residues are what are residue classes uh, we're going to look at a complete residue system and after that we have certain book sessions for senior math olympians and at the end a similar but challenging problem this video is sponsored by chinta.com since 2010 Chinta has trained thousands of students from all around the world in mathematical olympiads, physics olympiads, computer science and informatics olympiads, ISI CMI entrances, and research projects for school and college students. Okay, so this is a really cool problem. Find all triplets a comma b comma n such that two is for a plus two is for b is equal to n factorial. Given that a comma b comma n are natural numbers, now here's the thing: you'll see like a lot of problems like these uh, in number theory in a lot of Olympiads, and really, you know, the only way to solve them is maybe to reduce certain mod n. You know, reducing mod n is probably one of the most general and one of the most um, effective strategies that you can say to solving such problems. And in many cases, you really need to only figure out the value of n. In some cases, you can just look at it and see it. Um, that okay, you need to reduce mod five, you need to reduce mod seven, you need to reduce mod three, mod six, whatever. And how do you know that? It's usually just because of experience, and you can just try out certain values. Maybe try reducing mod three, mod four, mod five, mod six, mod seven. It's usually up till there, until unless something specific has been given the question. So, for example, if you're reducing mod hundred and twenty, that's really not going to be the case in most questions, until and unless. there are certain things given the question for example if you have let's say five factorial somewhere in the question so may, it may be a good idea to check mod 5 and then check mod 120 right so <laughs> those are the kind of that that's kind of the intuition that goes behind this problem another thing that to look at is uh, problems like these in number theory they really can either have like a very small number of solutions let's say two solution three solution four solutions or it can have a large infinite family of solutions and again it's just experience as to figure out uh, how you would have figure out like to kind of estimate either it whether it would have like small solutions a uh, small number of solutions or it would have an infinite number of solutions so here you can actually see that it is 2 is for a plus 2 is for b is equal to n factorial and whenever you have like an exponential uh, term on one side and a factorial term on the other side it's usually not an infinite number of solutions because these two things they don't really go well together and uh, they just they just probably won't converge to a particular value an equal value on most situations it's probably only having a small number of solutions this is kind of the thought process that's going in my mind when i see this problem so um yeah let's just see let's just see uh, how we can uh, work with this okay so they've given us 2 to the power a plus 2 to the power b is equal to n factorial now uh, i'm going to work mod 7 okay you can work mod 3 mod 5 mod 11 also i believe uh, you can very well formulate the good solutions with that but i'm going to work mod 7 because it's apparently a little bit easier by that So um so let's consider the case where n is equal to greater than equal to 7 right let's consider this case So case 1 where n is greater than equal to 7 So if n is greater than equal to 7 that essentially means that n factorial is congruent to 0 mod 7 right So now we're going to look at uh, certain things called modular residues right modular residues Some people also call it residues mod n, right? Whatever you can call it, whatever you want. Residues mod n. So here, what we essentially do is we take some value of x and compare them with two raised power x mod n. And in this case, we're going to be looking at two raised power x mod seven. So if I put x equal to zero, two raised power zero uh, mod seven is one. If I put x equal to one, I'll get two. If I put x equal to two, I'll get uh, four. If I get x equal to three, I'll get eight mod seven. But essentially, that's one. And uh, after this, things keep on repeating. So two raised power x mod seven 
is essentially um, 1, 2, and 4. Or in, in other words, I can write that 2 to the power 4 is congruent to 1, 2, 4 mod 7. It can either be one of these three quantities. And this 1, 2, 4 is called a residue class. Right, so this is called the residue class of 2 to the power x mod 7. Right? These are called as residue classes. Now, what's a complete residue system? So let's take a complete residue system. So for example, so for example, if I uh, take a number, let's say if I take a number one, if I take a number, let's say nine, and if I take a number, let's say 32. Now this is a complete residue system mod seven. Why? Because um, uh, two is about x mod seven. Why? Because when you divide by seven, you get the remainders one, two, and four, which satisfies the residue class of two is about x mod seven. So this would be a complete residue system. In other, in other words, um, the elements of a complete residue system, you need to have all elements such that, um, so that you know, these, these three terms are essentially satisfied. If that makes sense. So whenever you divide these three numbers by uh, seven, you take its mod seven, you should get these three quantities. And all of these three quantities should be over here when you take mod seven of that particular class. But that's what residue classes are. That's what the complete residue system is. And that's essentially the concept of residues. So uh, the takeaway for this problem is we essentially found that 2 is for x is congruent to 1, 2, 4 mod 7. So effectively, 2 is for a is going to be 1, 2, 4 mod 7. And 2 is for b is also going to be 1, 2, 4 mod 7. And on the right hand side, we have seen that n factorial is congruent to 0 mod 7. This is obviously for n greater than or equal to 7, which is the case that we are currently analyzing. Now, if you can see 2 is for a plus 2 is for b, can never be 0 mod 7. So effectively, it says that we have no solutions for n greater than or equal to 7, right? That's a really neat result. So we have no solutions for n greater than or equal to 7. So n can only be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. And um, yeah, those are really the only solutions. n cannot be 0 because 2 raised power a plus 2 raised power b is equal to 0 factorial is equal to 1. This again has no solutions. So n can only be 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, 6. Now, if you actually see 2 raised power b plus 2 raised power b, 2 raised power a plus 2 raised power b is greater than or equal to 2 raised power 1 plus 2 raised power 1 because a, b, and n are natural numbers. So 2 raised power a plus 2 raised power b is greater than or equal to 4. And uh, if you actually see that 1 factorial is 1, 2 factorial is 2. So n uh, cannot be uh, 1 or 2, right? So n has to be 3, 4, 5, 6. Because if it's 1 or 2, it really, it's uh, 2 is power a plus 2 is power b will always be greater than that. It will never be equal to that. So n can only be 3, 4, 5, 6. And after this, we can really make just, just make cases and check. So let's just uh, take the case number 2, where n is equal to 3. Now, when that is the case, 2 is power a plus 2 is power b is equal to 3 factorial. So 2 is power a plus 2 is power b is equal to 6. And you definitely get a solution over here. You will get 2, 2 squared plus 2 is power 1 is equal to 6. So your solutions are 2, 1, 6 and 1, 2, 6. Why? Because A and B are symmetric. Never, ever, ever forget symmetry in the problems, right? Sorry, not 6, 3 actually. My bad. 3, because we're taking 3 factorial and then getting 6, right? So never ever forget symmetry in the problem because uh, this might just be a silly mistake and you might lose quite a few marks uh, over here. You'll, you'll miss a lot of solutions really if you ignore symmetry. So these are the two solutions that we have received from this case. Now let's move forward. Let's take case number three. And now we'll analyze where uh, n is equal to four. So two raised power a plus two raised power b is equal to four factorial. So essentially two raised power b plus two raised power b plus is equal to 24. Now, uh, how can you form 24 as the sum of powers of two? Well, one way I can see is that 16 plus eight is 24. So essentially two raised power four plus two raised power three is 24. So the solutions over here are 4, 3, 4 and 3, 4, 4. Again, not to ignore symmetry. So we get two solutions for this case. Now after this, we are going to see what is this case number four, right? So case number four, that will be n is equal to five. So two raised power a plus two raised power b is five factorial. So two raised power a plus two raised power b is equal to 120. Now, how can I form uh, 120? Well, 2 raised power a plus 2 raised power b is equal to 120, right? And 120 can be written as 64 plus 32 plus 16 plus 8. Really, really nice partition, actually. And uh, this is effectively the binary representation of 120. 
right? This is called as a binary representation of 120 and binary representations are unique, right? So binary representations are unique. So what I'm trying to say is that you cannot form 120 in any other way than this, including powers of two, right? So for example, if I were to include two raised to the power a1 plus two raised to the power a2 plus two raised to the power a3, all the way up to two raised to the power an is equal to some quantity, let's say c, then this would be a unique value. So if that exists, if such a binary representation for the exists, then that would be unique, right? So effectively over here, two raised to the power a plus two raised to the power b can never be equal to 120 because we already have this representation of 120 and it involves four powers of two and not two powers of two. So this case has no solution, right? Case number five, this is number four, this has no solution. And then we move on to our last and final case, case number five, where n is equal to six. And in this case, two raised to the power a plus two raised to the power b is six factorial. And two raised to the power a plus two raised to the power b is 720. And uh, over here, we can actually see that 720 is again, 512 plus 128 plus 64 plus 16, which is the binary representation. And again, because of the fact that the binary representations are unique, it can never be equal to 2 raised to the power a plus 2 raised to the power b for some uh, natural numbers a comma b. But therefore, this also has no solution, right? So therefore, our only solutions, only solutions are when n is equal to 3 and n is equal to 4, which are um, 1 comma 2 comma 3, 2 comma 1 comma 3, and then we had 3 comma 4 comma 4 and 4 comma 3 comma 4. So yeah, that's kind of the takeaway from the problem. Never forget symmetry because if you forget symmetry, you would have only had two solutions. And in reality, we have four solutions. And it's a good way to it's a good way to solve number three problems by taking mod n, certain reducing mod n. And uh, yeah, I think we've solved a pro similar problem like this before. I think it was the IOQM or something. And uh, yeah, so you can really see that uh, reducing mod n is actually a very important technique and you'll see it all the way right from pre-RMO, RMO, IOQM, all the way up till uh, certain problems with the IMO as well. It's definitely a very important concept to know. So moving on to certain book sessions for Senior Maths Olympiads, we have Elementary Number Theory by David Burton, Principles and Techniques in Combinatrix, Problem Solving Strategies by Arthur and Jell, Functional Equations by Venkatachala, Problems in Plane Geometry by Sharigan, and Elementary Number Theory by Siapinski. Right, so at the end we have a similar but charging problem. And I want to find out all triplets a comma b comma n such that 3 is power a plus c is power is n factorial. And uh, it's given that a comma b comma n are natural numbers. So even over here you have to reduce certain mod n. It might be a good way to maybe think of let's say mod 3, mod 7, mod 5, mod 11. These are, or, or maybe even mod 2. You know, these are certain uh, common uh, ways to reduce mod n. These are actually used the most from my experience. So it's always a good way to maybe kind of look at the residue classes of uh, 3 raised to the power x mod n. If we look at the residue classes of 3 raised to the power x mod n, try to use the idea of bounding like we had seen. If we had seen the previous problem, n greater than equal to 7 had no solution. Maybe try to use a similar idea and uh, and then let's see how far you get. So if you're able to solve it or make any progress on it, let me know in the comment section. And uh, until then, I'll see you in the next video. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. The programs are designed for students who are passionate about mathematics. And they are personalized with one-on-one -on -one training, individual evaluation, and remedial sessions. The reason Chinta students are successful over the last 10 years because they are taught by mathematicians and real Olympiads from leading universities in India, United States, and Europe. Some of our students come back to teach at Chinta from Oxford, Cambridge, Harvard, MIT, UCLA, ISI, CMI, IITs, TIFR, and IISC. For more information, visit Chinta.com.